colossal walls of history's mega forts still stand hundreds, even thousands of years after they were built. Billions of tons of stone and earthworks across the planet are proud reminders of a mysterious past. So too, the stories of the men who built them and tried to bring them down, who created nations and ultimately our world today. To discover them, we must journey back to a time when men fought and built to dominate an entire world. In 55 BC, Julius Caesar led a Roman invasion force of 80,000 highly trained soldiers deep into hostile territory. He wants glory. Glory is the great vote winner in Rome. And he also wants money. He wants loot. He commanded one of the greatest armies ever to take the field of battle. It is the classic army of all time. But Roman military might faced a great challenge, the Gauls. This was a formidable enemy. I mean, the Gauls were a sophisticated foe. On the battlefield, they were a match for the Roman army. Six years of bloody battle had not brought a conclusive victory for either side. Caesar's troops, worn down, ground down, were still prepared to take the fight to the enemy. They were prepared to go through hell for Caesar. The Gauls also had a charismatic leader, Vercingetorix. He was fighting not for slaves or booty, but for his homeland. In 52 BC, the Gauls finally managed to come together under their leader, Vercingetorix. They rallied at the hilltop fort of Alesia. Caesar's army surrounded the settlement, and the future of Europe hung by a thread. They'd run the fox Vercingetorix to ground. Both armies readied themselves for the final showdown. Caesar has to take Alesia, or everything he's achieved in the previous six years will probably crumble. Caesar took a decision that is unique in military history. He ordered his men to lay down their arms. This wasn't a battle that was going to be decided with the sword and the javelin. This was a battle, and indeed a war and a country, that was going to be won with the spade. In order to trap the Gauls in Alesia and starve them out, Caesar ordered the construction of a fully fortified stockade that would surround the town. 19 kilometers of defenses to be built in just three weeks. How was this extraordinary feat possible? The Roman army was an incredibly sophisticated, trained and drilled machine. A legion of 80 was divided into 10 contraburnia, or squads, of eight men. Within the squad, each man had a rotating daily duty. One would cook, two would guard. The rest would chop and dig to build a fort. They worked a full day of solid manual labor. There was no need for fitness programs in the Roman army. Their entire life was one long physical workout. At Alesia, the back-breaking effort required for 60,000 men to build 19 kilometers of fortification only using muscle was not to be enough. Another danger was on its way, for not all the Gallic tribes were trapped inside Alesia. There's another problem. There's a huge Gallic army of relief heading his way. With up to 250,000 enemy reinforcements, only three weeks' march away, Caesar had to move quickly. He has to build another huge wall facing outward. Having built one 19-kilometer wall in just three weeks, Caesar had only three more weeks to construct a second 21-kilometer wall, around 40 kilometers of defenses, in just six weeks to create the largest donut-shaped fort in history. He's having to fight inwards and outwards. This is the hilltop fort of Alesia, and this is where the Gauls found themselves trapped by Caesar. And in an attempt to stop the Gauls gathering provisions and fuel, Caesar decided to build a wall around the outside of the fort at the base of the hill. However, the Gauls had managed to raise an army of reinforcements which was approaching from the rest of the country. And so to defend against this, Caesar had to build a second wall, a contravallation which went around the first wall and effectively barricaded himself in between these two walls. And it's from here he successfully managed to defend the world's one and only ring-shaped fort, 
with enemies on the outside and enemies on the inside. A Roman fortification was more than just a wall. Layers of obstacles formed an intrinsic part of the defences. Ancient Discoveries is investigating the details of this integrated defensive system and will test whether it was possible to build such a complicated fortress in the few weeks Caesar had. The mainstay of a Roman fort was its oak wood fence. Damien Goodburn is a leading expert in ancient wood construction. The felling was done with axes. People would cut a V or a mouth or a gob where they want the tree to fall. That's the first cut they would do. And then they go around the back and cut a narrower V, a little higher up the back cut, um, which will eventually end in the tree falling in that direction. The next task is to make the stakes that form the wooden walls, known as a palisade. These stakes are called pales. To make pales at speed, the Romans didn't use saws. They split the timber by hammering in tapered iron spikes. The split timber is quicker as long as you've got reasonably suitable material. But a Roman fortress was more than a wall. When you were building a castle, the objective was to put as many stumbling blocks in the way of the enemy. So you would start off, for instance, by building ditches around the outside. John Naylor is working with a team of experimental archaeologists. Today's test for these men is to try and build a section of palisade and trench the way that the Romans would have done it. We're trying to work out just how much this section of eight men can do in a day. John can then calculate whether Caesar's 60,000 men could have built 40 kilometers in just six weeks with the tools and equipment available. These aren't props. They're not fancy dress. These are real linen tunics, real caligae. Everything from their boots to the tools is just the way the Romans would have had it. So this is a serious attempt at a reconstructive experiment, experimental archaeology at its best. We've got our two trenches and a wall. This layout is specifically designed to stop the enemy being able to approach that palisade. A palisade on its own, a man could stand on his horse's saddle and jump over. You need the trenches to make it all work. But that trench at 1.5 metres, one and a half yards, it's a difficult jump, and a jump that a horse isn't going to like to make, onto this. This is deliberately sloppy, soft, this berm is unsteady to land on in between. You, can, you try and jump from one into that middle berm, you end up in one of the ditches. Of course, a horse is not going to land on such a narrow gap as this. On into the second trench. This one's finished, it's full size, and it's already starting to fill with water. The trenches and mounds were further defended with sharpened stakes two metres long. By heating them, they get much, much harder, as hard as iron. These are good improvised spears. Stakes like this, this long, sharp at both ends, Caesar ordered to be placed into pits about a yard deep in a sort of checkerboard pattern in front of the defences. Then he got even more devious. In front of these, he got small iron spikes. These he put in shallower pits, maybe only seven inches below the surface of the earth, then ordered that brush would be piled over the top. The Gauls came running along, plunged through the brushwood, and these spikes went through their feet. They were pinned in front of the Roman walls where Roman archers could easily finish them off. Hideous, nasty, very effective, my style of warfare. As the sun sets on Alesia, four metres of fully fortified palisade are in place. We've got trench, berm, trench, bank, stakes, palisade. There's no way I'd want to attack that. Allowing for constant skirmishing and injury, the test gives an indication of how long it would have taken Caesar's men to do the job. The answer is an incredible five weeks and five days. The fort was fully erected before the enemy reinforcements arrived. With no hope of resupply or reinforcement, Vercingetorix surrendered in five days.
With such an extraordinary achievement under his belt, nothing could quench Caesar's ambition. He went on to become dictator of Rome and founder of the Roman Empire. 1,600 kilometers to the north, Mike Lodes is investigating the castle that helped create Great Britain. This is an act of aggression, and that is what castles are for. Castles are tools of conquest. This is the story of a mega fort built not for defense, but as an aggressive weapon of attack. The medieval British Isles were dominated by violence and aggressive conquest, <coughs> driven by the castle. When we think of power struggles today, we think of power struggles between countries. In the medieval period, it's power struggles between little lords, great lords, and kings and princes, all of whom are vying to control as much land as possible. And that the centerpiece for each lord is to have his stronghold, his castle. The battleground was the territory of Wales, where the barons were rebelling against the English king, Edward I. Edward I was probably one of the first truly great warrior kings. And his whole reign, really, was, I think, um, defined by the fact that he was constantly at war. Many of the barons were fighting two wars, one against the king, the second against the other barons. One of them built a magnificent castle at Caerphilly. This is Caerphilly Castle in South Wales, and it's a fantastic castle. It's a, it's a classic medieval castle. It was built for a man called Gilbert de Clare, who was a powerful baron in 13th century Britain. Now, 13th century Britain is a very turbulent place. Everyone's land grabbing and making their alliances. Gilbert de Clare was a power player. His big enemy, though, was his neighbor, Llewellyn ap Griffith. What Gilbert de Clare did is he put this castle slap in the middle of Llewellyn ap Griffith's lands and said, if you think you're hard enough, come and get me. This is an act of aggression, and that is what castles are for. Castles are tools of conquest. The castle built by Gilbert de Clare was a revolutionary masterpiece of military planning. Its ability to embed itself deep into enemy territory obviously depends on its ability to defend itself. And here you can see that classic castle defence of the moat. The moat makes it difficult to get siege engines up to the walls. The moat makes it difficult in many ways. And you can see there, there is this revetting, this sheer stone wall on either side of the moat. So if you do even get men in there to try and make an escalade up it, they're like ducks in a barrel and they can't scramble out quickly. This is the first moat. This, of course, is a drawbridge. And if you're attacking, this is going to lift up and I'm leaving you there and I'm getting to safety over here. Even if Llewellyn ab Griffith's men could get across the moat, further pains awaited them on the other side. There are aspects of Caerphilly's defence that are as old as fortification itself. Things like these bastions, these, these buttressed towers along the wall here. And what they do is not only do they strengthen the wall, but by jutting out like that, they give you enfilading. So with bows, crossbows, with spears, whatever weapons you've got, you can shoot across the line. So somebody coming up to that wall, there, there's no safe spot for them. Everywhere along that wall, there's somewhere where you can shoot at them or hurl a rock at them. And if Llewellyn ab Griffith's men could avoid the arrows,